when you grow up poor, your concerns are, am I gonna buy food or am I gonna buy gas to get to work? You know, if I buy food, can I bum a ride from somebody? I definitely like money less than most of the people I know. Money, whether you like it, love it, or hate it, it affects everyone. And the way we think about money can have a profound effect on our happiness. Dr. Sonia Lubmersky is a professor of psychology at the University of California, Riverside. She's been studying happiness for 30 years. Certainly having money um, gives people opportunities to buy conveniences and luxuries, to find more fulfilling work, to spend time with people that you want to spend time with, to live in nicer conditions. There is a, a pretty robust correlation between money and happiness. Gary Vaynerchuk is the CEO of VaynerMedia. He's an investor, content creator, and entrepreneur. Though he's rather successful now, he comes from humble beginnings as the son of immigrants. If you're under 25, you think you have to make a million dollars a year to even be like in the game. I wish every 16 year old on earth thought 70,000, not a million, because you would have a whole different world. We even asked a few folks what their perfect salary is. Number wise, I would personally say around 80,000. My perfect salary would probably have to be $100,000. My perfect salary would be $350,000. My perfect salary will be $200,000 a year. Is there such a thing as the perfect salary? Nobel laureates Daniel Kahneman and Angus Deaton conducted a 2010 study about salary and happiness. According to the study, once you reach about $75,000, your happiness plateaus. You know, if you're not able to put a roof over your head or pay for food, then getting more money is definitely gonna make you happier. That said, if you're kind of comfortably middle class, you know, the, a, a number that's often thrown around in the literature is around $75,000 a year, if that's your family salary, then the research shows that getting more money isn't necessarily going to make you happier, which is kind of shocking. Yeah, that is shocking. Does that number still hold up today? Dr. Lori Santos is a happiness researcher and professor at Yale whose course on happiness has gained worldwide acclaim. When people hear that $75,000 number, they're like, well, is that really true? You know, should it be adjusted for 2020 inflation or if I live in San Francisco or New York versus like Iowa or something? But the research really suggests that it might tweak around a little the new number, but it's not gonna be that different. It's not gonna suddenly turn into $2 million that you need to be happier. I'm reminded of a study that asked people, how much more money do you need to be a lot happier? And no matter how much people made, they always named a number that was a little higher than what they had. And so it just made me realize that we're just always wanting more and we would never really be satisfied with a particular number, even if we thought we did. Research indicates that the human brain is rarely satisfied with one particular salary number. So why do we equate wealth with happiness? We do have this fantasy that more money more, and more success and more things will give us that ultimate sense of happiness. Dr. Brad Klontz is a financial therapist and professor of psychology at Crichton University. And in the United States, we really are consumers. And so we're really sort of wired to want more things. And advertisements actually sell this idea that you're gonna be happier if you have more things. And so it sort of gets baked in there and it's something that I would say is an affliction. It's an American affliction. Americans are hardwired to want stuff. This is partially a result of what researchers call social comparison. The notion that we want whatever our neighbors just bought. Keeping up with the Joneses and the, and the blind materialistic nature of our society leads to deep unhappiness. The reason buying stuff doesn't necessarily increase our overall life satisfaction lies in the concept called hedonic adaptation. Hedonic adaptation, and something that my lab has been studying for a number of years, is the phenomenon that people are really good at uh, getting used to changes in their lives, especially positive changes. Um, and so when we have a rise in income, when we buy a bigger house, when we get married, um, at first it makes us really happy, but then over time we get used to that change in our life and our expectations change and our lifestyle changes, um, and we adapt. 
It's a central feature of human nature, so we're not going to escape hedonic adaptation, but it's one that if we pay attention to, we can start realizing that some of our intuitions about what we think we need might be wrong. Our intuitions depend on many different factors. How we learn to view money is one of them. We all have these unconscious beliefs around money scripts. In our research, we call them money scripts. They're typically, we've inherited them from our parents or our grandparents or from our culture. But if we look back at the Great, Great Depression, we saw an entire generation of people who had different beliefs around money that lasted their entire lives. Even the way we make our money can affect our happiness. Lay people have a really fast notion. We think that money makes a job a good job, right? If you have a huge paycheck at the end, you must be doing great. You must love that job. But their research suggests that that's not really the case. In fact, there's a lot of folks who experience what's called golden handcuffs. In other words, they're trapped in this job that's paying them a lot of money, but that they absolutely hate it. But now that they're at a salary level where they're earning you know, $500,000 a year, it's really hard to shift, right? Because you bought a more expensive house, you bought a more expensive car and so on. What the research shows is that if you really want to be happy with your job, you shouldn't focus on salary. You should focus on whether the job is meeting what, what we often call your own signature strengths. These are your own values that you want to experience in the world. I would actually argue that humility is a much better indicator to happiness than financial status. And so I, I'd be more comfortable arguing the other way, that you're more likely to be happy if you don't have money. In 2015, CEO Dan Price was making $1.1 million leading the team at Gravity Payments. Now imagine that your CEO shows up to work that day and tells you he's taking a million dollar pay cut so that you can make $70,000 a year. That is a, a big shocking moment. As a result of Dan's self pay cut, the minimum wage at Gravity Payments soared to $70,000. Jose Garcia has been working at Gravity Payments since 2014. He's one of the employees who benefited from the salary bump. Prior to the bump, I believe I was at $32,000. Since the coronavirus pandemic hit, nearly all of Gravity Payments employees took voluntary pay cuts to keep the company afloat. But that initial gesture from Dan still had a profound effect on Jose. It's more about the mental burden that goes away uh, and those things that you're able to really not have to worry about. My mom and dad were both immigrants. You know, luxuries weren't really a thing. Our luxuries were like, oh, we're gonna go during the summer, we're gonna go to the pool or we're gonna go to the video rental store and rent the new release. It is like, you know, that adage where people say like, oh, money can't buy happiness. It's like, well, sure, I can see that, but it does provide mental ease and those types of things help you do things that make you happy, like focus on yourself, you know, preventative care, insurance, things like that. So it's a, it's a very like, there's a dichotomy to the money can't buy happiness uh, argument. More money doesn't necessarily equal increased happiness. How we use it is key. The research suggests that rather than spend your money on material purchases, it would be better to spend your money on experiences. Experiences have the feature that they don't often last long enough for you to get adapted to them. You know, you take a one week vacation and you're not really used to it by the time it's over. But also experiences can help us be more social. Um, usually when we're making experiential purchases, we do that with another person. You know, we go to the movies with somebody or we take a vacation with a friend. There's another way to use your money to your advantage. Give it away. There are three things that matter to happiness. Personal growth, connecting with other people, and contributing to the community or contributing to others. Philanthropy makes people really happy. I think right now we have this culture of self-care and treat yourself. You know, we think that material purchases for ourselves are the way to go. But the research shows that that's just not the case. Purchases that we make for other people tend to make us happier than those we make for ourselves. While research suggests that wealthy people are happier than others, the margin is slim. It could be that with more money um, comes more problems, like the song. You know, I just have so many friends who, you know, make $53,000 a year and genuinely enjoy their life. And then the serendipity of my life the last 20 years, I have an uncomfortable amount of friends who make $12 million a year and are unhappy. And, and I think we need to really redefine success. 
One of the reasons having a lot of money doesn't make us happy is that being really rich tends to be incredibly challenging for your social relationships. And that can create enormous stresses where the people who don't have the money feel shamed, the people who do have the money feel kind of icky about it, you know, how do you split the check and so on. And these kinds of stresses sound, you know, like you could kind of make fun of them, like, oh, I would, you know, there are stresses that I would love to have. I'd love to be a bazillionaire and, you know, deal with the stresses of how my family would react to that. But in practice, if you look at the rich people, they often feel incredibly isolated and incredibly lonely, mostly because it's hard for them to connect with other people. Take it from someone who knows. You know, it can be lonely on top. And I think the secret is, I don't think Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos, while they're way higher up than I am on the Forbes list, I don't think they're happier than me. There were certainly sacrifices that I made. Um, I went from having a personal assistant to not having a personal assistant. I went from owning you know, a, a second home that I rented out, which gave me additional financial security to selling that home. I went from owning my primary residence without any debt to having a mortgage like everybody else. Now, instead of taking a helicopter up to all the peaks of Alaska and snowboarding down, I have to climb up and it takes me two or three days before what took me like a half hour to do. But it's still pr pretty darn cool to be able to climb the mountain in Alaska, which I can do on $70,000 a year, even though I can't take the helicopter up to the top of the mountain, which I could do on a million dollars a year. Everywhere where it's been tried, including at my company, Gravity Payments, everybody's been better off, even the people like me that make less money. The pandemic has affected folks globally in regards to our salaries and our happiness. So what are some ways to make the money we have work in our favor? Spend it where you genuinely know and you genuinely appreciate it, not because you're using it as collateral to position yourself to impress people that ultimately you don't even like. No matter what salary level you're at, one way to improve your happiness is actually not to necessarily focus on your salary, but to focus on other things that we know matter for happiness. Your relationships, your community, your connection, just your presence and your gratitude. Those actually matter a lot more than the number on our paycheck.